Bismillah Rahman Rahim. I am Dr. Yasser Rahman, and today I will be talking about uh, oral anticoagulants. Uh, can I, everyone hear me all right? So, uh, so when we talk about an ideal anticoagulant, what are we looking for? I think uh, usually like if it can be given orally, that's a big thing because as we know about Lovenox, it's a hassle to give it like, you know, twice a day uh, and then injection form. So ideally an oral, uh, an anticoagulant should be like given orally, the dose can be like once, easily manageable, should have an antidote, should be inexpensive, shouldn't have any drug drug or food interactions, doesn't need any monitoring and there is minimal or no risk of bleeding and then no dose adjustments required. You start with one dose and uh, you carry on with that. Now, the first anticoagulant that we came across uh, was warfarin. I think it was introduced in the market uh, uh, as a rat poison in 1948 and because it caused bleeding, um, it was later, I think in 1954, it was approved uh, as a medication. And what it does is it decreases the blood coagulation by inhibiting the vitamin K uh, dependent uh, coagulant factors. And what it does is that uh, vitamin K epoxide reductase, which by inhibiting it, it um, stops the um, oxidization of the reduced forms of vitamin K1 dependent um, blood coagulation proteins, including uh, factor 2 and factor 7. So the onset of action usually requires about a day uh, before remaining uh, active clotting factors have had time to naturally disappear in the metabolism and the duration of action of a single dose of warfarin is two to five days. This is the reason why that when we are starting Coumadin, we usually uh, bridge them with Lovenox uh, for the effect of Coumadin to take place and only then we withdraw heparin or Lovenox or Clexane uh, from the picture. Again, the reversal of warfarin's effect when it is discontinued uh, or vitamin K is administered requires a similar time. So uh, it, it does take a day or two before it uh, effect can be uh, diminished or uh, reversed. Looking at the coagulation cascade, the new uh, oral anticoagulants, they are not new anymore, but the ones that are in the market in the last 10 years that came across uh, are the one that the factor 2a inhibitors or the thrombin uh, direct thrombin inhibitors uh, which i'm going to talk about and then the oral 10a inhibitors um, especially the river oxaban and epixaban i'm going to talk about them in detail so the first uh, direct thrombin uh, inhibitor was imelagatran it was a twice daily dose it was approved in the europe it was non-inferior for prevention of stroke in atrial fibrillation and also was being used for thromboembolic prophylaxis in hip surgery. However, in 2006, it was withdrawn from the market because there was at least 2% of the population who were exposed to zimelagatran were noted to have an increase um, in the, uh, their liver enzymes. So it was taken off the market. The next one that came in the market is Debigatran, which uh, is also known as Predexa. Uh, what it does is there is a specific and reversible inhibition of clot bound thrombin and free thrombin. So the conversion is independent of CIP450. Uh, the PPIs, if they are given in conjunction with Debigatran, can reduce its absorption by as much as 25%. Uh, there is a wide therapeutic window in preserved renal function and it is 80% renally excreted. So this is something we have to keep in mind, um, especially when we are administering Debigatran to someone with uh, reduced um, renal function. Uh, in Debigatran, the one thing that if we want to monitor the activity of Debigatran, uh, INR is not reliable. Uh, it can be done by looking at the thrombin time or the accurate clotting time. Also, APTT can also give us an indirect um, value or efficacy of Debigatran. And, and also an APTT of greater than 80 seconds at trough, like before giving the medication, is associated with an increased risk of bleeding, uh, especially when Debigatron was used in atrial fibrillation in, in a clinical study. So one can at least, um, I think APTT is easily available and one can use that as a, um, a 
as a marker for um, efficacy of dabigatran or to reduce its side effect. So uh, in dabigatran and atrial fibrillation, there was the RELI trial in 2009, there were 18,000 patients, mean age was 71 years. So they used two doses, 110 milligram twice a day. So there was a similar rate of stroke and systemic embolism and lower risk of major bleeding events. Uh, the higher dose, which was 150 milligram BID, there were lower rates of stroke and systemic embolism and similar risk of major bleeding events. So the FDA has approved uh, Demigatrin and atrial fibrillation for prevention of stroke. And the, the usual dose is 150 milligram that is uh, being considered. Uh, or usually used, but if somebody is at a higher risk of bleeding, then 110 milligram BID can be used as well. Um, again, as I alluded to in my previous slides, that dabigatran is contraindicated, uh, especially in patients with creatinine clearance of less than 30. Uh, also, it is warranted that a dose reduction should be done in people who have moderate renal impairment especially with the creatinine clearance between 30 to 50 ml per minute uh, and also who are at an increased risk of bleeding. Um, again, uh, especially in the elderly who are above 75, uh, similar precautions should be uh, used. And uh, again, dabigatran is contraindicated in patients with uh, active pathological bleeding. Um, this was the RECOVER trial. This was uh, done in 2009. There were uh, 2,500 patients with DVT and pulmonary embolism who were randomized to dabigatran 150 mg twice daily uh, versus warfarin. And this trial had demonstrated non-inferiority uh, between the two in the treatment of acute DVT uh, for prevention of uh, recurrent DVT as well. So this can be used as well uh, in place of warfarin. Um, in patients with DVT or PE. Uh, again, the duration of treatment, nowadays the guidelines have changed, uh, but again, if it's provoked, we know then I, I think three to six months is good enough. Uh, but if it is unprovoked, I think, uh, especially pulmonary embolism or if they are distal uh, DVTs, I think um, nowadays the recommendation is uh, more than three months. Sometimes they can extend up to lifelong depending on how severe the initial attack of pulmonary embolism was and uh, if it was unprovoked especially. This was the Renovate uh, 2 trial. This was the, it compared the efficacy and safety of oral uh, dabigatran versus sub-Q uh, clexane or enoxaparin loganox for thromboprophylaxis in patients undergoing total hip arthroplasty. So there were 2000 patients who were randomized to uh, 28 to 35 day treatment with oral dabigatran. It was a once daily dose of 220 milligram versus a sub-Q um, clexin or an uh, dose of 40 milligram once daily and which was starting the evening before surgery. And this study revealed that dabigatran was non-inferior to uh, loganox or enoxaparin. So again, it is it can be used, uh, especially in people undergoing hip arthroplasty that oral dabigatran can be given at a dose of 220 milligram and it is just as effective as uh, the same. Uh, also, it can be given um, especially in hip um, replacements and the risks and bleeding and safety profiles were similar. In terms of, I just wanted to uh, mention that there is a reversal agent for um, dabigatran which is uh, a monoclonal antibody by the name of idarucizumab. Uh, the other name, the trade name is Praxbind. So that's something that um, I, I don't know if it's available in Pakistan, but this is something to keep in mind that if God forbid somebody on dabigatran develops severe bleeding, there is something uh, which can possibly reverse it. Uh, now moving on to the oral factor 10A inhibitors. Um, uh, one molecule of factor 10 a uh, catalyzes about a thousand molecules of thrombin. Uh, again, the upstream inhibition causes less bleeding and then downstream inhibition. And so the first one that we uh, used or came in the market was rivaroxaban. It goes by the name of Zerento in the US. It is competitive and reversible inhibitor of factor 10 a uh, The peak plasma concentration is about three hours. It is 40% renally excreted and there is very minimal drug-drug or no drug-food interaction. Uh, and I think if we were to uh, 
it's it starts working in, in within 12 hours the same thing goes like if you were to reverse the effect uh, especially in people on rivaroxaban and if they develop like minor bleeding i think the first thing is to to stop the rivaroxaban and i think it takes like a day or two in fact within 12 hours the effect can be uh, is um, mitigated with, of the rivaroxaban after stopping it so this was uh, a trial, the rocket uh, trial, which was um, done to use uh, to see the efficacy of rivaroxaban in atrial fibrillation. This was done in 2009. There were 14,000 subjects, and this was basically uh, the dose was chosen of 20 milligram daily versus uh, warfarin dose uh, to an INR of between two and three, and this had revealed that there was uh, the rivaroxaban was non-inferior to warfarin for stroke and systemic embol embolism as you can see the rates were like 1.71 percent in the rivaroxaban versus 2.16 percent in the comedian arm uh, the incidence of bleeding was pretty much similar in both uh, the arms so uh, it can be used in atrial fibrillation as well uh, rivaroxaban can uh, has also been used and is recommended uh, to be used in people with DVT and PE. So this was the record trials. The, this was compared. The rivaroxaban was compared with Lovenox, and in this uh, trial, the 10 milligram daily was used uh, or compared to 40 milligram of Lovenox sub-Q daily, and we can see that there was uh, the, uh, the DVT prevention was like the risk was 1.1 percent versus 3.7 percent. Uh, in the river rocks again. Uh, the bleeding was only slightly uh, increased, but again, uh, I think it can be used. Uh, so the record two trial, there was uh, a good 4,500 patients who received either 10 milligram of, of the oral uh, river rocks again, once daily, uh, beginning after surgery or 40 milligram of enoxaparin, which was subcutaneously, which was started or beginning the evening before surgery plus a placebo tablet or injection. So the primary efficacy outcome was the composite uh, of deep vein thrombosis, non-fatal pulmonary embolism or death from any cause at 36 days, the range was 30 to 42 days. Secondary efficacy outcome was major venous thromboembolism, non-fatal pulmonary embolism or death from venous thromboembolism. So the primary safety outcome was uh, major bleeding. So the, uh, as far as the primary efficacy outcome uh, occurred in 18 of uh, the 50, uh, almost 1600 patients, uh, which was 1.1% in the rivaroxaban group and 58 of the 1558 patients uh, at 3.7% in the enoxaparin group. So major bleeding occurred in 6 out of the 2200 patients uh, in the rivaroxaban group and only in 2 of the uh, 2200 patients in the enoxaparin group. As well. So <clears throat> moving on, <clears throat> this was the Einstein trial which was done um, in people with uh, to compare the safety and efficacy of uh, rivaroxaban with standard therapy. So there were uh, 3400 patients with confirmed DVT with, with, without sy symptomatic pulmonary embolism. So the patients um, received either Zerato or standard of care which was enoxaparin bridge plus warfarin followed by warfarin. The treatment duration was 3, 6 or 12 months at the physician's discretion. Uh, principal efficacy outcome, symptomatic recurrent venous thromboembolism and the principal safety outcome was a composite of major bleeding and clinically relevant non-major bleeding. As we can see that after one year of uh, use, there was the primary composite endpoint, there was only 2.1% or 36 um, incidences in the 1700 patients on rivaroxaban and 51 patients uh, which came at an average of 3% uh, occurred in the enoxaparin and warfarin group. This was the Einstein again uh, this is the um, sorry about the uh, typo so it's the Einstein uh, pulmonary embolism trial and this was to compare the safety and efficacy of Zerelto with standard therapy in patients with confirmed PE with or without symptomatic DVT. So the patients received either Zeralto or standard of care, Lovenox plus warfarin followed by warfarin. The treatment duration was again 3, 6 or 12 months at physician's discretion. The principal efficacy outcome was symptomatic recurrent venous thromboembolism, 
and the principal safety outcome was composite of major bleeding and clinically relevant non-major bleeding. So again, this, uh, the patients were randomized and this was like after one year, we can see that the primary composite endpoint was uh, that 50 patients on the Zarento, uh, um, 50 out of the 2400 patients did have the side effects while um, only 44 patients uh, came at an average of 1.8% was in the Lovenox and Coumadin uh, arm. This is, uh, so moving on, this was the ATLAS trial, which was uh, to see the efficacy or the use of rivaroxaban in acute coronary syndrome. So there were 15,000 patients with the recent acute coronary syndrome uh, who were randomized to receive either 2.5 milligram and 5 milligram twice daily uh, for 13 and 31 months compared to placebo. The primary efficacy endpoint was a composite of death from cardiovascular causes, myocardial infarction or stroke. And as we can see that uh, the rivaroxaban reduced the primary efficacy endpoint versus placebo was 8.9%, 10.7% respectively. Rivaroxaban increased the rates of major bleeding uh, at a rate of 2.1% versus 0.6% in the placebo and intracranial hemorrhage as well was increased without a significant increase in fatal bleeding uh, or other adverse events. So I think they did look specifically at the, um, at the bleeding episodes and one thing was that yes, it, the rivaroxaban increased the overall risk of bleeding, but I think there wasn't a significant increase in fatal bleeding, so that's something to keep in mind. <clears throat> Moving on, we have uh, the second one, which is I think I usually prefer uh, to use more in my patients if I have a choice. Um, again, uh, I'll talk more about it. So Apexaban, he's, it has been available in Europe since May 2011 and was approved for preventing venous thromboembolism after elective hip or knee replacement. So in uh, the FDA granted approval for it uh, in December 2012 for indication of reducing the risk of stroke and systemic embolism in patients with atrial fibrillation that is not caused by a heart valve problem. So this is uh, the Epixaban in atrial fibrillation. So the Epix this is the Everos trial and this was basically Epixaban at, uh, at a dose of 2.5 or 5 milligram was compared to uh, the standard uh, uh, dose of aspirin. Uh, in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation to prevent or reduce the uh, risk of stroke. And uh, as we can see that the risk of stroke in patients on Epixaban was 1.2% in non-valvular uh, atrial fibrillation versus 3.7% in patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation uh, who are on aspirin. Uh, the bleeding risk, again, it is similar, almost comparable 1.4 versus percent in the Epixaban arm versus the 1.2 percent in the aspirin arm. Uh, the next one was the Aristotle trial. In this uh, 5 milligram twice a day, Epixaban was used versus warfarin to a target of uh, 2 to 3 in patients with non-valvular um, atrial fibrillation to prevent the risk of stroke. There were a good 18,000 patients. Um, it was one and a half year follow-up. And again, as you can see that the risk of stroke was re reduced um, in the, in the Epixaban arm at 1.27% versus 1.6% in the Coumadin and the p-value was highly significant. Uh, bleeding, again the bleeding risk was also uh, lower in the Epixaban arm versus the Coumadin arm uh, and the, again the p-value is quite significant. Epixaban uh, after this was also uh, used in uh, DVT and PE um, as well. So this was the advanced two trial. It was a multi-center randomized double blind study. Uh, it had a total of 3000 patients uh, and a 2.5 milligram twice a day uh, dose of Epixaban versus Lovenox 40 milligram um, subcutaneous daily uh, was used. So the primary outcome was the again the composite of asymptomatic and symptomatic DVT, non-fatal PE and all cause death during treatment. So the primary outcome was reported in 15% in this epixaban um, versus 24% in oxaparin. So obviously this uh, 
turns out in the favor of epixaban. Major bleeding was again 4% in the epixaban arm versus 5% in the low Lovenox or Enoxaparin arm. This is uh, again another study which is uh, the ADOPT trial uh, in this, this was just used uh, in patients who are really medically sick which had like uh, severe heart failure or respiratory failure and a dose of 2.5 milligram twice a day uh, for 30 days versus Lovenox 40 milligram for one to two weeks was used. Uh, primary efficacy outcome was a composite of again death related to uh, DVT, pulmonary embolism, or venous thromboembolism and again uh, it showed that the apixaban arm was much more efficacious uh, compared to Lovenox. The primary safety outcome was bleeding. Uh, the bleeding risk was slightly increased in the apixaban arm versus um, the Lovenox arm. One thing I, I would uh, mention here that apixaban, the reason why I said uh, I know it is compared to the Zeraldo or Rivaroxaban, the dose is twice a day but the one thing is that this can be the Epixaban gives us a, a higher range that you know even with people with less than 30 of threatened clearance it can be used so something to keep in mind that people usually like who have heart failure or like you know atrial fibrillation do have like other issues maybe long standing hypertension diabetes and their kidney functions are not pristine so that is something to keep in mind uh, to take away from this uh, talk that Epixaban can be or should, is an option to be given in uh, people who have renally impaired. Uh, in terms of epixaban for treatment of uh, venous thromboembolism, this was the Amplify extended arm uh, trial. So this was the epixaban 2.5 milligram versus 5 milligram compared to placebo in patients who completed 6 to 12 months of anticoagulation. So this was over and above after the standard treatment was completed. There was a total of 2400 patients who were randomized. There was recurrent venous thromboembolism or death uh, from venous thromboembolism occurred in 8.8 percent in placebo compared with only 1.7 percent receiving 2.5 milligram of epixaban. Major bleeding was um, 0.5 percent in the placebo group and 0.2 percent the 2.5 milligram epixaban group and 0.1 percent the 5 milligram epixaban group. Uh, this was uh, another study in acute coronary syndrome. I think this was a negative trial um, by the name of Epraise. Uh, so in this trial, Epixaban 5 mg twice a day along with standard antiplatelet therapy versus placebo plus standard antiplatelet therapy was used. There were 7000 patients recruited but this study was prematurely terminated as I alluded to. Uh, because there was a high risk of bleeding of 1.3% uh, versus 0.5% which was statistically significant um, and uh, so this was uh, obviously did not pan out well uh, in the acute coronary syndrome uh, status. The other no, um, novel anticoagulants which are in the um, available is adoxaban, betrixaban and idra uh, as well. The one thing I would mention is that in terms of like um, these newer uh, anticoagulants especially the Zerelto and Epixaban which are more commonly used in Pakistan we do have um, uh, an antidote which is uh, goes by the name of Endexa. This is available in the US I don't know about Pakistan but it's uh, Endexanet Alpha which is goes by the name of Endexa and then there is another one which is known as Arepazine, which is a <clears throat> which can be used to reverse the effect of both factor 10a inhibitors as well as dabigatran uh, as well uh, so something to keep in mind that we do have now a reversal agent for all these newer anticoagulants uh, as well uh, thank you for the for listening um, if anyone has any questions uh, kindly let me know Yes, Dr. Wade. I think I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yes, yes, go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. It's an important topic, especially for people in emergency and myself, uh, really interested in this topic. My, uh, I think my question got the answer at the end of the 
talk, but I would like you to elaborate on the, the reversal age and a bit more that uh, how can we give it and is it possible to have it here? And if not, what are the other remedies which we in the emergency department can deploy uh, to uh, have some effect on a patient who's bleeding because of the novel antibodies? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, excellent question. Uh, thank you for asking. So, so I think the algorithm by which I would go is the good thing about these newer anticoagulants is obviously that they have a short high half life. So, if there isn't like major bleeding, we can, uh, I think, just by stopping the medicine can help. If there is like you know moderate bleeding, we can use. Um, um, blood replacement products like you know packed RBCs if that that can help uh, it uh, the other thing is like you know uh, the prothrombin complex concentrate uh, which is I think it has like you know factor two and seven that can be used as well and then as far as this um, the reversal agents I'll have to look into I know even in the US they were like you know not um, uh, freely available so but I can definitely look into that if we can uh, get them or acquire them and have them in our pharmacy. So, but I think the algorithm would be to stop the, the agent. Let's see with that uh, prothrombin complex concentrate or blood products, and then uh, to come to the, uh, the final, the reversal agent. Thank you, yes, well, Just one more uh, question for us. So if somebody in the emergency presents with an acute coronary syndrome and it's on novel anticoagulants, so uh, what is the current guideline? I don't know from my UK experience that they say that don't give uh, aspirin at that stage or the, uh, the uh, clopidogrel. So what do you suggest in that? So, so I think in, in people, uh, especially if somebody presents to, to the ER with acute coronary syndrome and are on um, oral anticoagulants, uh, I think, and they are still having an, an, an MI, I think my, my choice would be to go with maybe uh, heparin or something uh, in that case, like, you know, because it, it, it has the same effect and you can easily reverse, I think, if it were to like, you know, go for cardiac surgery or something, you, they can go and heparin can be stopped and after an hour the effect can be uh, reverse, but I think I'll defer that question more to my uh, cardiology colleagues who might have a better answer. I, I think they, they must have a protocol, so that's the best. Uh, is, the best uh, is Umar there? If Umar can answer, yeah. Um, so when a person uh, comes in with acute coronary syndrome, and let's say they're on rivaroxaban or apixaban, um, for whatever reason, AFib or DVT, you would still, per guidelines, you would still give them aspirin. So you'd still give them aspirin um, down in the, in, at the point of contact. And then we would obviously hold the anticoagulant and we would more than likely switch over to Agristat or Terafibin or Integralin if, uh, Epitivifib if it's available in the cath lab. And then within that 18 hour period, while the Agristat is still running, we would then load with um, be it Ticagrelor, be it uh, Clopidogrel. And then you, there is guidelines that indicate you are safe to use triple uh, therapy, meaning low, uh, aspirin, one of the antiplatelets, either Ticagrelor or Clopidogrel, as well as a, um, a novel oral anticoagulant for about a month after an acute, uh, acute uh, cardiac event. Then you typically you drop your aspirin and you just continue with the Ticagrelor or the Clopidogrel and the um, DOAC or NOAC. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, it did. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I have a question. Is uh, We were talking about patients presenting in an emergency room with with bleeding because of this these oral anticoagulants. Um, and you mentioned that because we don't have uh, these reversal agents, we can use prothrombin uh, concentrate, uh, would that require a higher amount of uh, these concentrates because of uh, presence of uh, anticoagulant or, or inhibitor in the blood or just a normal no, I, I, dose? I think, I, I think even with the prothrombin <coughs> complex concentrate, I have to look into it that whether it's available and if it is, I think it's just the normal concentration that you give. There, there is no, um, <clears throat> I don't think there's a higher dose involved. It's just the regular dose that you have to give. 
ओके थैंक यू एनी अदर क्वेश्चन I think we are all set here. So thank you, uh, everyone, for listening. Advanced uh, Eid uh, greetings from uh, me to everyone. I hope you have a good uh, holiday, and I'll see you back in in a few days. Thank you so much for listening. Take care.